people for over a decade now and and an incredible presenter his topic is going to be the power of your identity and that's next month june 10th rock thomas and if you can check out our awesome lineup of incredible webinars we have throughout the year uh, have some great ones coming up, all sorts of different uh, topics on nutrition, living your best life, and I think you're going to be uh, extremely pleased with the, with the webinars we have coming up throughout the year. And then uh, this is all leading up to our fourth annual conference in Reno, Nevada, November 8th and 9th. Yes, I said two dates because this year we're expanding our conference not just one day but it's going to be two days and day one if anybody's been to our conferences before you know we have them packed full of information on living your best life day two is going to take it in a different realm it's going to be on mind body connection and how to uh how to get the best performance out of yourself so uh so we'll have more details of that as the summer rolls on here. Uh, one other thing, if you could opt into our mailing list, if you haven't done that, uh, please do because we have opt-in only and you can do that on our One Life Fully Lived website to opt into our mailing list so you get all the information of what's going on with One Life Fully Lived. And one other thing we'd love you to do and that's to ask questions of Chris while we're on this webinar, so uh, I, I think Hello? Chris is. I think Chris is all ready to go. Brian, you got them all set up. Just about. Yep. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, guys. So, without further ado, I'm going to give you one quick intro of Chris. Anybody who's been to our uh, three conferences now, you know Chris is an incredible presenter. If you haven't heard Chris, you're in for a real treat. And I'm not taking any more time. I'm just giving you the legend, the man, Chris Lockhead. Thank you, Tim. Um, that's very, very sweet of you to say. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's, uh, it, it's great that you're here. And it's interesting, you know, most people spend more time watching TV than they do working on their life. And so uh, on behalf of Tim and Tina and Brian and the whole One Life team, we really want to thank you for carving out some time today to uh, work with us on your life. All right. So the first thing I'd like to share with you is that a legendary life it is not an accident. And the sort of ultimate of a legendary person, in a lot of people's opinion, is what Maslow called being self-actualized. And that's the concept of being everything that is possible or capable for you to be. And that's what we want to talk about uh, this afternoon. Hey, Chris. In order to do that... Chris, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just let me know when you want the slides to move since I'm controlling it from my end. Um, I'm going to just move really quickly. If I say next slide a lot, I'll, that's the most thing I'll say. So if it's possible, Brian, if you could just kind of shuck and jive with me. All righty. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So we're actually on the next slide now. Um, <laughs> so the, the three components of living a legendary life that we're going to talk about today are context, relationships, and flow. And those of you who have been at some of the One Life events, you may have heard uh, me and some other speakers talk about the concept of context, and we're going to talk about relationships and flow in a way that uh, uh, I don't think you've heard at One Life. You might have heard in other places, but not at One Life before. So off the top, the first thing I'd share with you is, if you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know that you have one? And in, in, with that said, I have a small request. I today would like to challenge you to change your mind about yourself, other people, and the world. Because legendary people uh, have, a, have a different context about themselves, other human beings, and the world than people who are not legendary. All right, so let's talk about most people. And I'm going to share with you something. Uh, I want to warn you off the top that some of you might find this harsh, but I think you'll also find it true. 
Uh, we believe, and when I say we, I, I mean my partners, Al, Dave, and I at Play Bigger, we believe there's three kinds of people in the world. Those who suck, those who don't suck, and legends. And like I said, well, that might sound harsh. If you take a moment to think about it, it's actually true. In life, um, we tend to bucketize people and anything, frankly, in those three buckets. So if you think about uh, the last restaurant you ate at, when you walked out of that restaurant with your friend or your spouse or your, your, your colleagues, what was likely the discussion about your experience in the restaurant? Most of us say, well, that was awesome, it was okay, or it sucked. Same thing about movies or TV shows or places you like to visit and, of course, people. And so whether we like it or not, as human beings, we naturally put uh, things into these three buckets. And so the question is, if you want to live a legendary life, what separates the people who are legendary from the people who suck and don't suck? And the first thing I'd share with you about that is that people who are legendary make a conscious daily commitment. That is to say, suck and doesn't suck is an unconscious thing that happens over time. So think about a, ch a child, for example. Is there any 5 to 10-year-old you know in your life who says, mommy, mommy, or daddy, daddy, or uncle, uncle, or whoever you are in that child's life, when I grow up, I want to not suck? No. Most children have very big dreams. They want to save the world, they want to be artists, they want to be firemen, they want to be painters, they want to be athletes, uh, maybe they want to be business people, but they definitely have big dreams. There's no such thing as a five-year-old that doesn't have a big dream in their life. And then if you think about the average 55-year-old, how big is the dream for that person's life? And what you'll notice is the average five-year-old and the average 55-year-old have very different dreams for their lives. And... With most people, something happens over time, and that is as life's challenges begin to pile up as we grow up, we make an unconscious decision to surrender many of the dreams that we had when we were 5, 10, 15, or even 20, and we begin to uh, use words like compromise, and uh, we wake up at 35 or 45 or 55 or 65, and we go, what happened to our dreams what happened to our life. And what that is, is the difference between a daily commitment to living the life that you want to live versus allowing yourself to unconsciously surrender over time. So the question is, how do you get conscious about making that legendary commitment every day? And this is where we want to begin to talk about context. So I'm going to assume that everybody on today's call at some point in their life, and probably recently, has seen the television news. And if you notice, there's actually two parts to the news. So if you begin to uh, dissect what is being presented when you and I consume news, uh, you'll see two buckets of things. So in the weather report, you'll hear today we're going to have a low of 60 and a high of 85. And often we'll hear something with that that says it's going to be a nice day. Or, for example, when reporting about a car accident, you might hear four people died today in a car accident. And then you might also hear something like, and that's an awful tragedy. And what I'm distinguishing for us here is the difference between facts and context. See, the fact is four people died today in a car accident, or it's going to be, uh, we're going to have a low of 60 and a high of 85. Context is it's going to be a nice day, or that was a horrible tragedy. In other words, there are facts, the things that happen with no description, no opinion, no attitude, and then there is our opinion, our attitude, uh, our uh, editorializing, if you will, about those facts. And when we, you and I watch the news, for the most part, even newscasters are not clear about what's their opinion, i.e. context, and what is the fact. Sometimes the weatherman or gal will start off by saying, it's going to be a nice day today. Well, that's actually not news. That's their opinion. To sum it up, I go to two cultural icons, Judge Judy and the dude from the Big Lebowski. Judge Judy says, quote, I'm like a truth machine. Her job as a judge is to find the truth, and she actually doesn't care about context. 
And then the big Lebowski, the dude, famously said, well, yeah, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. And that's the difference we're talking about is there are the facts, there's what happened, and then there's our context about what happened. And the first thing to think about when leading uh, and striving to have a legendary life is what is my context? What are the attitudes and opinions that I'm really um, uh, embracing here? And we get caught because most of us accept as true about ourselves, others in the world, it's actually not true. It's our context. It's an opinion. So, for example, on the next slide, Brian, everything listed on this slide are things that many of us take as true. Well, here's good news. The stock market was up today. Or life is good. Or bad news. Uh, uh, the economy's bad. Or my father abandoned me. Or money's the root of all evil. Or another one we hear a lot in this country, America is the best country in the world. Well, you may agree or disagree with any of the things on this page, but what I can tell you is none of them are facts. They're all opinions. They're all context, even though we accept them as true. So let's go, Brian, to the next slide, and let's start to unpack what is this thing called context. So it turns out that our context acts like a filter through which we process life. It's made up of our attitudes, our assumptions, our opinions, and our beliefs about things. And um, it's rooted deeply, of course, in our past. So, for example, if I have an experience as a kid where I put my hand on the stove and I burn my finger, the likelihood of me doing that again is very low. And I carry that forward in my life, and so every time I see a burner on a stove that's on, I know not to touch that or my finger is going to get uh, burnt. And so as you and I grow up and we have experiences, they form attitudes, opinions, and beliefs, and ultimately things that we believe are true. There was a point in time where everybody on this planet thought it was true that the world was flat. And of course today we know that it's not because our context changed when discoveries were made to show that the earth is actually circular, it's round. Now, if you think about context, um, in one way, it's incredibly powerful, and in the other way, it's incredibly limiting. So in the way that it's powerful, let's stay on context, Brian. In the way that it's powerful um, is when you and I are applying an experience that we had to the past, to the, to the current or to the present, in a way that allows us to produce a result that we couldn't produce if we didn't have that prior experience. A simple example is driving a car. At one point in your life, in my life, driving a car was very new. It was very hard. It was, it was incredibly consuming of our attention. Where's the brake? Where's the gas? Where's the shifter? If you're learning to drive a stick like I was, all the traffic, the road signs, the unpredictable behavior of other drivers, et cetera, et cetera. And over time, as we gain experience, we're able to drive our car, and we can talk on the phone. We can have passengers, and we become what you might call unconsciously competent at driving. That is to say, we drive our car and we actually don't think very much about take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake and the kinds of things that you have to think a lot about when you're learning. So in the first circumstance, like a, a, a learning to drive a car, when you have the context called, I'm a successful car driver, you can apply that context to today and go run an errand to the store or commute home from work or whatever it is you're gonna do and you're able to produce that result very easily. And in that way, our context helps us. There's a way in which our context doesn't help us, and that's when we want to learn something new. Or more specifically, when we want to produce a big discontinuous breakthrough in our results in our life. Because a lot of us have what you might call life-limiting context. And for some of us, it can be harder to learn new things as we get older. Um, I'm 46 years old, and I learned to surf in my late 30s and early 40s. And surfing has been one of the most difficult things, uh, physical things I've ever had to do, and frankly, one of the most difficult things I've ever learned in my life. And I marvel at um, watching kids learn to surf and how much easier it is for them. And the simple reason 
other than having an old guy body. Uh, but the simple reason is they don't have the context that I have, and my context actually, my experience of doing other things has made it harder for me to learn. And that's true for many of us as we go forward. And there's one other critical thing about context. Much of the context that you and I carry around, we carry around as true. And so uh, it's like a label that gets put on us. Oh, I'm creative, or I'm not good with money, or, uh, you know, uh, I had a bad childhood, and therefore fill in the blank. And we make this truth that is actually an opinion, we make that truth that's an opinion that got formed in the past limit what we allow ourselves to experience and produce and enjoy in the present. And so what's my point? Legendary people consciously create a context that works for them. At One Life, we spend a lot of time talking about goals and writing them down and repeating them and saying them to ourselves and so forth. What you're doing when you do something like that, or if you've ever used affirmations, or if you've ever participated in a mastermind group or some other uh, support group of friends and colleagues who get together and encourage each other in their life or their careers, what we're doing when we do those things is we're actually trying to alter our context so that we can achieve what we want to achieve or we can experience and have what we want to have. And so legendary people make a conscious decision about their attitudes, opinions, assumptions, beliefs, experiences, and they decide how they're going to look at any experience in their life as opposed to accepting a limiting context from the past as truth. All right, we can go forward, Brian. Thanks. So you say, well, okay, that's great. If I want to create this powerful context, I can create my context of myself in any way that I want. Um, the reality is we all have things in our life from our past that stop us. An example for me is math. Math is incredibly challenging for me, and I found out when I was 21 years old I was dyslexic. And so math is an ongoing challenge for me in a way that it isn't for others. Some of us have all kinds of negative context, context that gets in our way. And while some of that requires some serious work, and sometimes in our lives we need to go into therapy or we really need to have our friends and family close by to help us deal with something uh, tragic or upsetting that's happened with us, and that's an important thing to go do. Many of us carry around negative context from the past like it's a Samsonite tied to our butt, and as we develop more and more of these Samsonites, we drag all this luggage around. And in our country today, uh, we sort of you could think of it as the doctor filification of America. Everybody wants to get together and have this conversation about how horrible their life is and their childhood and all the stuff that happened to them, and I need to process it, and I need to talk about it, and this is the reason why I can't be successful in my career or my marriage or in my education or what have you. And like I said, well, some of that stuff deserves real work. A lot of it is something that we should just get over. Legendary people train themselves to drop their context. And you and I can choose the way we view ourselves, other human beings, and the world. And some of us have some stuff in our um, past. Let's go to the next slide, Brian. Some of us have some things in our past that the best answer for us is to just drop it. Just let that Samsonite go and be free of it. And you might think, well, it's not that simple. Here's what I would ask you to think about. What if it was what if it was possible for some, some upset that you've been carrying for two years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years to just drop it and not have your life be about that anymore? And I've seen people do it, and I'm grateful that others have helped me do that with things that held me back in my life. And I'm telling you, it's possible to make a decision right now to drop your life-limiting life context and begin to create a context for yourself, others, and the world that will really empower you. All right, now let's move forward and talk about relationships. Um, later on today, I'm going to talk a little bit about a wonderful movie, a documentary called Happy, that I highly recommend you see. 
I, I really recommend you watch it with the people that you love in your life. It's, it's an amazing body of work that is a, a, an analysis based on actual research into what makes people happy. And one of the ahas in the movie is there's no such thing as a lonely centenarian. A centenarian is a person that lives to 100 or beyond. And it turns out the vast majority of centenarians have very powerful relationships. And we go to the next slide, Brian. Um, there's a scholar named Jeff Grief, and he's done a lot of research on the difference between male relationships and female relationships. And he has a wonderful way of describing it. He said, men have shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationships. That is to say, we men tend to do things together and watch things together. And women tend to have face-to-face -face relationships. That is to say, they actually look at each other and talk to each other. And uh, I thought that was a wonderful, simplifying way to think about um, relationships. And the truth is, whether you're male or female is irrelevant, all of us need relationships that are both things. I don't know about you, but, you know, as a guy, I can tell you, the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationships I have with my male friends, if I take Tim, Tim Road as an example, Tim and I love to do shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder guy stuff together all the time. We like to go hiking, climb mountains, and ski them, and go scuba diving, and we, we like to go do things together in the world, and that's a, a, a very typical thing, particularly for men. However, the wonderful thing about my relationship with Tim is our shared, if you will, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder passion, particularly for skiing and mountains, has evolved so that today, Tim and I have both a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationship and a face-to-face -face relationship. We can talk about life and our relationships with our spouses and, you know, I don't have children, but Tim does and, you know, his family and, and his career and so forth and so on. And so as our relationship has developed over time, uh, Tim and I, in my estimation, let's see what he says, have developed a wonderful combination of both shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder as well as face-to-face -face, uh, strength in our relationship. So if you say that's the goal is to have great relationships with a handful of people that really matter to you, the question is that are a group combination of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder and face-to-face, -face. The, the question is how. Let's go forward here, Brian. Let's actually just skip two slides. Let's go to the, the circle slide, slide 26. Um, so this piece of work is an extraordinary piece of work. There's a huge uh, section in a book called A Manual for Life, written by Bennett Wong and Jock McKean, who I've referenced here on this slide. Uh, brilliant, brilliant guys who are uh, uh, gurus, if you will, in the area of human development, relationships, and communication. And they have a very simple model that's presented here on how relationships develop. So I want to take you through it quickly. All new relationships start off in what uh, Bennett and Jock call romance. It doesn't necessarily need to be a romantic relationship, but all relationships start there. That is to say, when two people meet, or even it could be you with like a new job or something like that, but when you begin a new relationship, uh, whatever the, the context of it is, there's always this romance stage. That is to say, um, each party in the relationship is excited. There's something attractive about the two individuals involved to, to each other. And they have a little bit of a, a fantasy, if you will, as to um, – what this new person or this new job or whatever it is could be in my life and some need that I have that this new opportunity or this new individual could fulfill. And for, for uh, one reason or another, that's very exciting. That's sort of what romance is like. Now, as you move forward in the circle towards power struggle, um, what drives the circle forward, first of all, is getting to know somebody. So in the beginning, romance is a bit of a fantasy. As we get to know someone, we realize who they are and get to know that real person. Um, and an important pivot point in relationships happen here, which is this concept that Ben and Jock call uh, power struggle, which is every relationship ultimately has different roles and different responsibilities that develop over time. Who's going to do what? You know, um, when I first met Tim, we started skiing together. He was a big backcountry skier. That was something I really wanted to do, but I had no experience in, and Tim had a lot of experience in. And so very quickly, in the context of skiing, and particularly backcountry skiing, um, our relationship, he became my coach, if you will, in backcountry skiing. 
And um, so who leads, who follows, and in what circumstances does, you know, the, how does the relationship play out? That's what power struggle is all about. And sort of getting that right and, and, and allowing the relationship, if you will, to take its natural form is um, wh what it takes to sort through power struggle as well as a willingness to get to know the real person. As that happens and we continue through the circle, we either come out the other side of power struggle and get the stability. Okay, so we're no longer in romance, uh, but we now know the other person better, and we are now on a more solid grounding to move forward in whatever path our relationship is going to take. If power struggle doesn't go very well, we can pop out of the circle and end up in what uh, Bennett and Jock call apathy. And you know you're in apathy or you know someone else is in apathy when you hear them say things like, oh, that's just how Jimmy is. There's no changing him. You know, there's no talking to her, et cetera, et cetera. We sort of give up on the relationship. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really kind of a bummer of a place to be. Now, if we get the stability, we know each other, we're starting to do more stuff together, the relationship's really taking form, we've kind of gotten through the power struggle, and we get to know each other even more, the relationship deepens, and now we can begin to start to make some commitments. And the commitment can be uh, as simple as, hey, would you like to go uh, skiing with me next Thursday? Or as big as, hey, let's start a company together, or let's get married, or uh, anything in between. And I know a lot of guys have a challenge with that word commitment, and some people, some women do, of course. I don't mean to uh, uh, um, uh, overly bucketize these things. Um, but the interesting paradox of commitment is most people who resist commitment do so because they believe that it limits their options. Because the minute you say, yes, I'll go skiing with you next Thursday, that means I can't do any number of other options next Thursday. However, if you start to examine commitment, what you'll probably start to notice is that our only real freedom in life actually lives in commitment. That is to say, while you're keeping your options open, you're not moving things forward. And when you do make a commitment, now other options are off the table, you can fully engage. And that's where relationships get incredibly powerful. And then the relationship can develop to the next phase, which is called co-creation. And this is probably the most exciting place a relationship can exist because when two people come together and they work on something or they do something together, they can create an experience for each other and others um, where the sum is greater than the parts. One plus one equals three. And certainly that's, what hap that's what's happened for me in my relationship with Tim. And if you start to think about your relationships with the people that you matter, that you do things with, that you participate with, that you share your life with, that you share the experiences that matter the most to you with, what you'll probably notice is um, there's a huge source of co-creation where together you're bringing things forward and enjoying things in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Now, the one other thing I want to say about this model that I think is incredibly powerful is relationships, of course, are dynamic. And so if you think about your relationship with anybody of consequence in your life and you think about it in the context of this circle, what you'll probably notice is where you are in your relationship moves around at any given time. So, for example, if you're in that real co-creative stage, you might actually fall back in love with that person. It's happened to me more than once. Tim and I, and many times I was a good group of friends, we're out on a mountain, we're having a beautiful day, and we're getting some great runs. You know, maybe we're about to go get another run, and we just climbed another five or 600 feet to go get that next, that, that, that next peak. And you're sitting on top of the mountain with a handful of people you really love, doing something you really love, and you're doing it together in that co-creative state. You kind of look around and you go, man, I love these guys. And, uh, and so when you live in co-creation as a big part of where you are in your relationship with somebody, it can often remind you or fire back up that initial spark that brought you together. And over time, the relationship will pinball around uh, to all of these different components. And the question really becomes, in the relationships that matter, where do I spend most of my time? All right, now let's talk about flow and begin with the movie Happy on the next slide here, Brian. Uh, Roko Bellick, the director of the movie, said it's pretty simple. Happy people do the things that make them happy. Uh, next slide. The flow has been described as the ultimate human experience. And so what are some examples of slow? Let's go to 29, Brian. Uh, the skier who dances with trees, the surfer who disappears on a wave, the inventor who gets lost in discovery, the songwriting 
channel music, not just write it. The team of individuals who act as one. The mother who, when watching her child's play, gets lost in that experience. The sales rep who gets uh, swept up in the excitement of deal making, and on and on and on. Um, the couple who are in love, and when they're together, they lose track of time. Or the business collaborators who are working on a new product, and as they work on that new product, uh, when they come to a great prototype that really works, they can't even remember whose idea was what component of the product because one plus one equals three. And that's what happens in flow. We get lost in flow, and who we are disappears because of how engaged we are in whatever it is we're doing or experiencing. Let's go to the next slide, Brian. The father or grandfather or godfather of flow is a wonderful psychologist uh, whose name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, and he wrote a book called Flow, and most of the work on this topic goes back to him. And he's one of the first uh, researchers to actually study in a scientific way human happiness. His work is, the, is, is, is what the movie Happy is premised on. And he says that flow is performing an activity fully immersed with a feeling of energized focus, full involvement, complete absorption. Now, let's go to the next slide, Brian. The, 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 um, there's a book that came out fairly recently by Stephen Coulter um, that is also predicated on the work of flow, and he applies it to uh, super achievement in life, and he particularly analyzes high-performance athletes. And he says, flow is the opposite of thinking. When you're in flow, every action, every decision leads effortlessly, fluidly, seamlessly to the next. It's high-speed problem solving. It's being swept away by the river of ultimate performance. And I've come to realize in my life that the things that matter most, the things that I pursue, are all things that create flow. There's a lot of work in all of these books about the chemical reactions that go off in our brain when we have these experiences. And I'm sure you've had them. Anytime you're lost in the moment, either enjoying something or doing something, you're probably in flow. And there's a set of dopamine and other chemicals that go off in our brain. And many people think it's the ultimate of life is to be in that state of flow, either with yourself and what you're doing, or I find for me, it's even better uh, when you're participating in something uh, with the people that you love. So flow, relationships, and context. And it turns out they all come together. And so what I'd like to do now is walk you through 10 ideas for leading a legendary life in each of those three areas and ultimately how the, the ideas of context, relationship, and flow come together for creating a legendary life. So number one, your context is what defines your relationship with yourself, with others in the world. So you, know, you might say it this way. For a photographer, the most important thing is the lens. And your context is the lens through which you process life. Next slide. What most of us go through is we accept the context of others as true. So if I got told in school that I was a bad athlete, I live that out like it was true. Legendary people get conscious about creating their own context, and they invent themselves to be who they want to be. That's what Maslow's talking about in being self-actualized. Next slide. The other is love. It may sound like a corny thing to talk about, but the truth is legendary people, they love the life, they love themselves, they love others, and they love the world around them. They center their life on it. Number four. Build a legendary tribe. If it's true that there's no such thing as a lonely centenarian and that relationships are the biggest thing, the biggest source of meaning and satisfaction in our lives, then consciously creating a tribe who you hang out with and live life with uh, becomes incredibly important. Uh, Richard Bach, the author, said, rarely do people of the same family grow up under the same roof. And so while Family members can certainly be part of our tribe, and I love my, if you will, my birth family. But uh, I know I can speak for Tim. I know I can speak for Dave and Al, my partners at Play Bigger. I know I can speak for my wife, Carrie. We're very conscious about creating a tribe of people who are uh, either in our family or adopted family, if you will, to surround our lives with and to live our lives with. And so Tony Robbins is right. You become who you hang out with. In that context, let's go to slide number five. Um, 
you go to create your life with the people you love. There was a point in my life where I thought the greatest achievement in life was the ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want. And if you could do that, then you were self-actualized. You really achieved nirvana. What I've learned over time is as great as that is, and it is, there's something, there's another level, and that other level is when you can actually design your life with other people. Where do you want to live? What's the work you want to do? What's the kind of family you want to have? What are the experiences you want to have? What's the difference you want to make in your life? And when you do that with others, it's incredibly powerful. In my case, I'm in business with my two best friends, and creating a business is part of us creating a life together. Let's go to number six. So if you think about flow, it becomes critical to ask yourself, what are my sources of flow? You know, for me, it's experiences with my friends and family. For me, it's the achieving and accomplishing of things. And I have also realized I spent a lot of my life chasing powder, chasing waves, because when you're skiing in powder, or when I'm skiing in powder, or when I'm surfing on a great wave, those moments force you to be fully engaged, fully present. And so those are my sources of flow. It's in, if you're going to live a legendary life, understanding what your sources of flow are is critical. And then number seven, the next one, Brian, um, is architect your life. As you go to co-create your life with your tribe, architect it around the things that produce the most flow experiences for you and the people you're co-creating your life with. Number eight, have an embarrassing amount of fun. I look for philosophical leadership in rock and roll, and one of the greatest rock and roll movies ever is a, uh, a comedy called Spinal Tap. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's got a lot of life lessons in it. And one of them, when the bass player is asked what the band's motto in life is, he says, have a good time all the time. And the older I get, the more right I believe Spinal Tap is about that. Okay, next slide, number nine. How do all these things come together? Well, it turns out, that to have a legendary life means that you purpose-built your context. That is to say, you are responsible for creating your own view of yourself, other people, and the world. And you choose to look at things in a way that's empowering to you as opposed to disempowering to you, and you create a context that works for you in your life. That's not to say you're a Pollyanna, you know, all of us have challenging, horrible things sometimes that happen in our lives. Sometimes somebody we love gets really sick. And I'm not saying you should put happy ears on about that. You have to acknowledge that that's what's going on. And so this is not about positive thinking in that context, but it is about a context that works for you. So if you or somebody in your life has something challenging that happens to them, rather than taking a victim, woe is me context, what's a powerful context that's going to help you deal with your situation powerfully? Who are those relationships that matter? And then how do I create a life that's architected around the relationships, the experiences I want to have that produce the most amount of flow for me? And number 10, it turns out it takes courage to be legendary. As we talked about earlier, when we were talking about context, people who don't have a powerful context, it's as a result of unconsciously surrendering their dreams and accepting their own negativity or mediocrity or whatever you want to call that. They get beaten down by life. And the courageous people refuse to do that. They take responsibility and they have the courage, the audacity to design and create a legendary life with, for themselves and with the people that they love the most in the world. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Um, it's been great being with you this afternoon, and uh, I don't know what part of the world you're in. I'm in beautiful California. I think we're setting a, a heat record today in Santa Cruz, California on the coast, and I really want to thank you for participating uh, with me and my One Life colleagues today, and we're ready for questions. I think Brian's collating questions if you have any. Thanks yes. for your time and attention. Chris, I must say that that didn't suck. That did not not suck. That was absolutely legendary as usual. So. Thank you well, so much. Well, kind of you to say, Brian. <laughs> uh, we're going to open it up uh, to questions. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to add, it, add them in the GoToWebinar control panel. I know Tim's going to jump on here, and Tim had a few things to say as well. Tim, are you there? Yeah, I am, Brian. And uh, we, we had a question here. 
Um, you know, in the relationship slide you showed with the, with the apathy being off to the side, how do you know um, if it's just a bend in the fork of the road or if it's time to move on in a relationship? <laughs> Great question. Um, you have to go back to what originally attracted, the, let's assume it's two people, the two, those two people in the first place. And so the way you get out of apathy is essentially by reminding each other uh, why you fell in love in the first place. And I'll give you a real concrete example uh, in my life. As I mentioned, I'm in business with my two best friends, Al Ramadan and Dave Peterson. And um, I know a lot of people would tell you that's a dumb thing to do. Uh, we think it's an awesome thing to do. But we're human beings just like everyone else, and as much as we love each other and as long as we've known each other and all those things, we, we get into apathy with each other, and it happens. And, it, you know, it's not infrequent. It's a normal part of being in a relationship. When that apathy starts to get out of control and it maybe starts to turn a little bit into resentment or, you know, I'm ready to kill one of them or one of them's ready to kill me or whatever the case may be, the kind of normal things that happen in relationships, we've actually established in our business a document. We call it our constitution. It sort of sits next to our um, legal partnership agreement. And our constitution essentially maps out why we're in business, why we're in business together, and what we want to do, what we want to achieve, and most importantly, how the three of us are going to uh, be with each other to make those things, those dreams that we have for our business come true. And part of that is we've, uh, we've used an old pirate term called parlay. Um, and what a parlay is, is it's not a surrender. But it's basically, instead of a, 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 a waving a white flag, it's a way of saying, hey, listen, um, let's call it truce here. So a parlay is a truce. And we are allowed to, whenever things get tense and we, we feel that, that moment coming on, to call a parlay. And when one of us calls parlay, everything that happens after that parlay happens with no retribution, immediate amnesty. And it's gotten to a point with the three of us where all that needs to happen is somebody needs to say parlay, and the tension comes out of the air, and we go, oh, for the love of God, why are we really in business together? And we get back to, if you will, true to it, back to what matters. And so to answer your question, Timmy, um, if you're in a relationship with somebody where you've tried to create you know, multiple parlays, if you will, however you try to do it, to break you out of whatever – uh, vicious cycle you might be in of apathy, and for whatever reason the two of you can't do that, it may very well be that that's a relationship that you shouldn't have. And choosing to exit a relationship or end a relationship is um, an incredibly powerful thing to do. And I'm, I'm sure everybody on the phone has done that, and certainly I have done that. But if it's somebody that matters to you, the, the real question is, can you fall back in love and re-kick romance? And the way to do that is to do your version of calling a parlay. And if you do that a handful of times, and either because of you or because of them or some combination thereof, then I think you just probably have to say it wasn't meant to be, and, and you move on without that relationship. Did I answer your question, Timmy? Uh, yes, it did, Chris. Thanks a lot, man. Really appreciate it. Um, I don't see any more questions on the board. If anybody has any, please uh, do write them in there. Here's, here's the best things I got out of this, and anybody that knows me uh, knows this. I can relate to this one. Do what you like, when you like, with who you like. And I think that was an incredible, great statement. My favorite slide you had, Chris, and some of you, I want you to pay per careful attention to it. Get over it, get over it, get over it. I believe he had that written over a hundred times. And, and <laughs> check yourself, where could you use this in your life? And the uh, um, two, two books, or I believe the Happy is, is a documentary, right, Chris? Yeah, it's a movie. It's a documentary based on the concept of flow. And it's, it's, it's not a typical sort of uh, motivational kind of a, a, a movie. It is based on actual research into what makes human beings happy. And um, the fascinating thing is many of the things that we in our culture, particularly here in the West and, and in America, um, think make us happy actually don't. 
so it's a very fascinating film. It's, it's a very easy movie to watch. It's not um, overly uh, clinical. And like I say, I highly recommend getting together with a group of people that you love and uh, having a coffee or a glass of wine or whatever you enjoy to do and, and watch it with those people and have a discussion afterwards. It's a wonderful thing to do. You could do it with teenagers or even children in your life. I've done that. It, 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 it yields a very powerful conversation. I've even watched the movie where we pause it and we talk about a certain concept that's been presented and the research around it. So it's that kind of a movie if you want to if you want to get into it. That one, and uh, Chris just spoke to another group that I'm a part of, and we talked about the movie or the book, The Rise of Superman. I highly recommend that book. Um, we, it, and, uh, and it'd be great if, as a community, all of us watched the documentary Happy and, uh, and read the book Rise of Superman, and it's going to make for a great conversation. It's also going to take our culture, our One Life culture, in a direction where we're all, you know, working on our happiness, working on our flow. And if you caught, flow isn't just for athletics and being out doing what Chris and I call getting the goods. It's also very relatable to business, your relationships within your family. It's just putting yourself in a state where, where good things show up. So uh, the, both of those, that, the happy movie and the book Rise of Superman, it'd be great as a community if a lot of us uh, read that book, watched that documentary, and used that as uh, something to help take us all to another level. So, yeah, the uh, other interesting thing about the Rise of Superman is even though the book is actually about flow and for the most part he uses action sports like surfing and skiing and and uh, the X Games and things along those natures as examples because the, the thesis that Stephen uh, Kotler uses in the book is that in order to perform those kinds of athletic activities, you have to be in flow. He calls it flow or die. He gives an example in the book of the guy who jumped the Great Wall of China on a 70-foot ramp on a skateboard. And he says, when you're skateboarding over the seven, over the, the Great Wall of China, if you're not in flow, that is to say fully present, engaged, focused, and, and being able to react, being in a, you know, in a dance with life, if you will, um, if you're not in that state, you die, flow or die. And that's sort of a fascinating thing that he talks about. However, while he never speaks to this in the book, the unspoken part of, of the rise of Superman is how these extreme athletes, by using flow, have altered context, both for themselves and for others. In other words, a lot of people didn't think certain athletic feats were possible. In the surfing world, for example, for a long time, people didn't think you could paddle into a 50-foot wave or a 60-foot wave that you needed to get towed into by a, a jet ski. And now, extreme surfers are paddling into these waves. And he gives many, many examples like this. And so there's an interesting connection between context and flow in the book, even though he doesn't explicitly use the concept of context. Hey, Chris, we're, we're just about out of time. We, we've had some great testimonials put in the question box, but we do have one last question for you um, and to you too, Tim. Um, it's from Graeme asking, how do you move away from people who are old friends but don't fit your personal vision of the future? Do you want to go first, Tim, or do you want me to start? Go for it, Chris. Yeah, you know, candidly, oh. Graham, um, I, I don't ever cut, this is Tim talking, I, I wouldn't cut them out of my life, I think, uh, in, unless they're toxic. If they're toxic and they're, and they're negatively affecting your life, cut them out. But if they're just not going where you're going, that's okay. You know, I have a, I have a lot of friends who, who are very motivated to live an exceptional life. I also have friends that just are, are fine just kind of hanging out and being where they are. And unless they're toxic, I still spend time with them. And I still kind of, in my own little way, try to move them up a bit and help them find their way. 
but uh, I, I find uh, it's really hard to find good friends. So, so unless they're um, detrimental to me, I, I, I personally wouldn't cut them out. Chris, what, your thoughts? Yeah, I might have a uh, uh, – philosophically, I agree with you. I might take a bit of a sharper edge to it. I would never write anybody off. Um, there are some people – that said, there's some people that I never need to talk to again in my life, and that's just fine. Um, and so if you're going to create a legendary life and you believe what uh, we believe, which is a huge part of that is creating your tribe, then people who are like-minded, uh, people who are in the, in the tribe who are healthy, who are fun, uh, who are successful, and when I say successful, I mean they're successful human beings. They may be, uh, they may not be rich. Uh, those two things are not necessarily connected. And if you watch Happy, there's some fascinating research about financial wealth and happiness that that blows most people's mind. It, it's overrated, is the net of it. But you should watch it for yourself. But all that is to say, I want to be surrounded with people who I think are legendary. And so, while I do agree with Jimmy, there's a lot of people who I don't think are legendary who I wouldn't necessarily write off. I'm also not in a hurry to spend time with them. And there are other people in my life that I have just cut out because um, it's just disempowering to be around them. I don't want to be around them. My life is – it's interesting. When you get your life to a place where all the relationships that matter to you are healthy, nobody creates any unnecessary BS or drama. And for the most part, you spend most of your time with people you love, admire, respect, and appreciate doing things together that you want to do that make a difference to you, whether it's sitting on the couch watching your favorite episode of you know, House of Cards or you know, going on a trip together or going through you know, just a simple walk through your neighborhood and everything in between, no matter how you – know, no matter what it is, when your life is centered around uh, doing those kinds of things with the people that matter to you, and your relationships in general work, what you'll notice is the relationships that don't work and the people who do create drama and the people who do create upset and the people who do have negative context, you just won't want to spend any time with them anymore. And while you might see them from time to time, um, they kind of melt away naturally because your tolerance for it goes down. I'm not interested in being with people who are downers. I'm not interested in being with people who aren't um, you know, striving to live a great life and aren't good people. I'm just not interested. Perfect, Chris. Hey, well, this has been an incredible conversation. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this, Christopher. You're a, a, what, a what a blessing and a gift to One Life Fully Lived you are. You guys, this conversation is going to continue on our One Life Community Facebook page. That's the number one life community. If you're not a member, um, please ask to opt in and we'll make you a member. Uh, please share this webinar. You're going to get a recording of it. Please share it with friends that you care about. And uh, Christopher, once again, thank you very much for your time. Everybody tune in next month for uh, Rock Thomas and the power of your identity. And uh, go make great things happen and go get the goods in the woods as you should. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Bye-bye bye now. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Tina. Thank you all for joining us today. Knock them alive. Right on, Chris. Later, thanks, dude. Bye-bye.